Thanks. Um, okay. I just wanted to welcome everyone to this webinar series, which is entitled Post Philosophies and the Doing of Inquiry, for those of you who don't know about it yet. And this is the 11th of the series, which means that we're nearing the end of it because we have 14 altogether. And we've had a great time hearing from a, a, a range of scholars thus far. It's a free webinar series um, with uh, 14, as I said, in total, which meets monthly on the topic of post qualitative inquiry and the doing of inquiry inspired by a range of post philosophies. And each session involves one or two international guests who have experience with inquiry approaches inspired by post philosophies such as post humanism, post structuralism, affect theories feminist new materialism and post-colonialism. So I'm Vivian Bozilek and I'm co-hosting this webinar with Candice Kuby. The webinar series is made possible by a collaborative partnership between the University of Missouri system and the University of the Western Cape, uh, where I'm from, or UWC in Cape Town, South Africa. So we've had a long partnership between our universities. It started in 1986. And uh, the webinar series is funded through the University of Missouri South African Education Program Committee, which supports academic exchanges between the University of Missouri system and UWC and provides opportunities for teaching and learning research and community engagement between the two universities. And Candice and I are very grateful for our university's long time collaboration and there's particularly their support for this webinar series. These webinars are also available on YouTube. You can find them on the website if you want to access them and you can also subscribe to the YouTube series. Also on YouTube, you can select an option for closed captioning to see a written transcript of the webinar. We're also excited to share that the webinar series will become two special issues in the journal Qualitative Inquiry. So over time, panelists will publish their webinar in an article format, and we'll be giving you more information about that. We've updated the website with the exact times for each webinar as um, we didn't take into account the daylight savings time. So please do check the time posted next to each webinar on our website as the series moves forward. Now, next time we have Sarah Truman, who's located in Australia. So please do note that we're going to start two hours prior to accommodate Sarah in, in Australia. So we're very excited to have um, Figile Ngomalo and Eve Tuck with us today. And I just wanted to ask them if they could just briefly introduce themselves before we get going. Figile. Oh, hi everyone, it's great to be with you here. Thank you Viv and Candice for inviting me to be part of this series. Um, I'm Figile Namalo. I am assistant professor at OISI at the University of Toronto and I'm looking forward to the conversations. Great, thanks. Mm. Greetings all, my name is Eve Tuck and I also am a professor, an associate professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at University of Toronto. It's wonderful to be colleagues with Fikile. Um, I have lived in Toronto, uh, which are the homelands of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people since 2015. Uh, prior to that, I lived in New York and grew up in Pennsylvania. I am a uh, uh, Alaska Native person. I'm Unanga from St. Paul Island, Alaska. Thanks very much. I'm going to hand over to Candice. Wonderful. It's great to have you both. So a few um, introductions here before we jump into our conversation. Erin um, Price is with us today and she is a PhD student at the University of Missouri. She serves as a graduate research assistant with me. Erin is an artist and an art educator with experience coordinating preschool through secondary art education and US public schools, as well as community-based art explorations at home and abroad. 
Um, Aaron is particularly interested in the role of material invitations, affect, and artistic encounters in the becomings of identity and community. And we also like to note um, that Aaron is the artist who has provided the beautiful artwork that's a part of our webpage, a part of the videos that are posted on YouTube. Um, and she also provides a lot of technical assistance um, in helping this webinar series come to be. So thank you so much, Erin. We're so glad you're a part of the series. Thank you. And now to introduce our two co-hosts, Dr. Candace Kuby is an Associate Professor of Learning, Teaching, and Curriculum at the University of Missouri, where she's also Department Chair and Director of Qualitative Inquiry. Dr. Kuby's research interests are the coming to be of literacies when young children work with artistic and digital tools, and approaches to and pedagogies of qualitative inquiry when thinking with post-structural and post-humanist philosophies. She is the author of several books, co-author of several books um, with her longtime research partners, um, Speculative Pedagogies of Qualitative Inquiry, uh, Disrupting Qualitative Inquiry, Possibilities and Tensions in Educational Research, and her scholarship also appears in journals including Qualitative Inquiry, Journal of Early Childhood Literacy, Journal of Liter Literacy Research. Vivian Bozilek is an Emerita Professor in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Western Cape. She is also an Honorary Professor in the Center for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning at Rhodes University. She holds a PhD from Utrecht University, and her research interests and publications include The Political Ethics of Care and Social Justice, Posthumanism and Feminist New Materialisms, and Postqual and Participatory Methodologies. Her most recent co-edited books include Posthuman and Political Care Ethics for Reconfiguring Higher Education and Higher Education Hauntologies, Living with Ghosts for a Justice to Come. Thank you both for making space for this learning and becoming together. Thanks, Erin. I'm just going to give a brief overview of Zoom and then we're going to get on with the important matters. You might have noticed that we're using the Zoom webinar platform instead of the meeting platform. So here only hosts and panelists have the video and audio functions. As we mentioned, we are recording this webinar for public viewing later on YouTube. The chat function is open for you to connect with other attendees during the webinar. I see a few of you have chatted already. But we are asking that any question for the panelists is entered through the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. This will make it easier for Erin and I to moderate questions, so we're not scrolling both through the chat and the Q&A function. And just um, take a little minute to see where that button is on your screen. So this is the way things will work in the webinar. For the first, and excuse the dogs barking, for the first 30 to 40 minutes, Candice will interview Fegile and Eve on four main questions, which we've been doing for all the webinars, for those of you who've already attended. And you can also find them on our webpage. While discussing these questions, um, uh, Fegile and Eve might share examples and um, also refer to their suggested readings. And then Candice will spend some time talking to Figile and Eve on how they mentor and teach graduate students when engaging with their philosophies and doing inquiry. And I, I think that Eve and, and um, Figile are going to have a discussion with each other about their work, which, which I'm very much looking forward to. And just before we have the Q&A session. So we, we, have, we usually have about 30 minutes for the Q&A session. So please think about questions as the webinar goes on and put them down in the Q&A as you think of them. And we're going to be moderating those um, and we'll get to them at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Candice. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks for that information. So a little bit more of an introduction of our two guests and then we'll jump into our uh, four questions that are the thread for our webinars. So Fikile, as mentioned, is an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching and Learning at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. 
Her work is centered on environmental and place attuned early childhood education that is situated within and responsive to children's inheritance of settler colonialism, anti-Blackness and environmental precarity. Her book, Decolonizing Place and Early Childhood Education, which is with Routledge, um, examines the entanglements of place, environmental education, childhood, race, and settler colonialism and early learning context on unceded coast Salish territories. So welcome, Fikile. And Eve Tuck, as mentioned, is an associate professor of critical race and indigenous studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies of Education at the University of Ontario, where she is the Canada Research Chair of Indigenous Methodologies with Youth and Communities. Eve is an enrolled member of the Aleut community of St. Paul Island, Alaska. Eve's work focuses on how indigenous social thought can be engaged to create more fair and just social policy, full social movements, and robust approaches to decolonization. She is co-editor of a book series titled Indigenous and Decolonizing Studies in Education, is the co-creator of the Citation Practices Challenge, and the founding director of the Tuckeronto Circle Lab. So I must say how thrilled I am to have this conversation with you both today. Fikile, as a fellow early year scholar, I have followed your work for years and find many ways that you provoke my thinking and ethics as a teacher and researcher of young children in this lively world of more than human relations. Rereading some of your suggested readings for today reminded me of how your scholarship has shifted how I, as a white settler woman, think about things like bees and water tables that are so prominent in early childhood spaces. And Eve, um, you probably don't know this, but I remember attending a sessions of yours at AERA, and um, I'm not even sure how many years ago that was or what city it was in at the time. And just um, since then, reading your scholarship alongside graduate students in the qualitative research courses that I teach and the philosophy classes that I teach, it has provoked so much discussion on things like axiology and research relations. And students often come up to me after the semester and share other books and articles of yours and ask them if I've read it yet and if I'll read it with them. So your work has really been inspirational to me as well. So we're so pleased that you both could be with us today. Um, so let's begin with our first question that we're posing to all of our panelists in this series. Um, and the question is, how does your philosophical approach influence your ways of doing inquiry? And it, it doesn't matter to me which one wants to jump in and start first. I don't know if Eve or Akile want to start us off with that question about how your philosophical approach influences your ways of engaging in inquiry. can start. Um, so I want to um, start by stating that I'm speaking today um, on what is now in, to, from what is now Toronto on the territories and lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. Um, and Toronto is also a place of long Black presence and relations between Black Indigenous and Black Indigenous peoples. Um, so in terms of that question, um, I would say there are three main um, interconnected philosophical orientations that guide how I do inquiry. Um, and when I think of inquiry, I think not only about research, but the inquiry work that I do with young children and teachers, particularly in relation, in relation to um, engaging with place in critically oriented ways. So um, the first area I think of major philosophical inference in my work relates to my interest in working um, with conceptual orientations that really help me to respond to the ways in which anti-Blackness emerges in the places and spaces um, of early childhood education, particularly um, in relation to my interest in rethinking environmental education. And so in that work, Black feminist theories have been a really important grounding for doing this work. Um, so for example, in my most recent work, I've drawn on Tina Camp's work on Black refusal, Black fugitivity and Black futurity. Um, in a paper that will appear in Qualitative Inquiry, um, where I want to put forward some affirmative ways of engaging Black children's place relations and to put forward um, an intervention into what I see as um, really an overwhelming amount of research that's concerned with revealing the harms that Black children face in education. Um, and so in that same paper, which I think also speaks to my commitment to engaging inquiry in ways that bring Black and Indigenous theorizing into conversation, 
Um, I also draw on uh, Dr. Tuck's work on disrupting the idea of re revealing damage as a theory of change. Um, and in terms of um, an example of how the philosophical thought guides my inquiry, while that particular paper is primarily conceptual, um, I also put those Black feminist, con uh, feminist theoretical concepts to work um, to do a reading of everyday encounters between a young Black girl and Austin Creek where we spend time and some of the anti-colonial place attuned pedagogies that we enacted at that particular place. So for instance, I think um, through a relational lens of Black refusal as futurity about what it might mean in terms of what I noticed differently about those particular encounters, including their effective intensities. And I would also add that in particular within the umbrella of Black feminist theories, Black feminist geographies um, have been really important to my concerns with um, disrupting um, in place anti-Blackness in early childhood studies in the context of the US and Canada. Um, and then the second kind of major area of philosophical in influence in my work, which I think is also a part of responding to anti-Blackness is an anti-colonial orientation. Um, and Black feminist work has also been really important to me in thinking through those ideas. For instance, Tiffany Tabo King's work, um, which I draw on in the article that I shared for the webinar called Decolonizing Place in Early Childhood Studies. Um, that work has been really important to how I think with anti-coloniality. And then uh, indigenous theories are also really important to how I approach anti-colonial inquiry. Um, and I would underline here that um, it's important that I draw from anti-colonial thinkers um, from the geographies of the places close to where I was born and spent the first 18 years of my life. So for instance, I've drawn from Bahela Chilisa's work, Leslie Legrange's work and John and Beatty's work. Um, and at the same time, because my work is situated within the settler colonial context of North America and emphasizes relations with particular lands, waters, places, um, I often think alongside the work of indigenous scholars on Turtle Island. So for example, um, I've drawn an Anishinaabe scholar Leanne Simpson's concept of presencing um, to help me articulate uh, what I call refiguring presences as a conceptual methodological and pedagogical orientation for thinking about children's place relations um, in ways that unsettle anthropocentric um, enactments of outdoor education in Canadian contexts. And so in my work, I'm interested in presencing as practices um, that encounter indigenous epistemologies and land relations as always already present, despite the effects of settler colonialism. Um, and so in that work, I use the term refiguring presences to describe this anti-colonial orientation. Um, so for instance, I've engaged with uh, refiguring presences through interruptive visual and textual storytelling of children's encounters with the forest in British Columbia. Um, and so in that storytelling, I diffract descriptions of children's encounters with uh, logged tree stumps, with the forest trail, um, with indigenous stories of cedar as relative, with colonial histories of logging and so on. And then just quickly, the third area of philosophical influence, which is also interconnected with anti-coloniality that I'll briefly mention is um, concepts and theories that help me to unsettle anthropocentricism and human centricism, um, and relatedly nature culture divides in early childhood education. Um, and in this third area of influence, I draw from many perspectives, including again, the work of black and indigenous feminist theories, and as well as some critical post-humanist uh, oriented work. Um, and often in my work, I find that I have to bring what can be um, disparate philosophical orientations into conversation, um, because I'm always grappling with how um, a disruption of human centricism as a part of um, responding to current ecological precarity um, can also not be a flattening of human difference. Um, and so bringing these perspectives together helps me to do this work um, in researching children's everyday encounters with more than human others. Um, and I'll just say quickly, for example, um, in one of the articles that I shared for the webinar, co-authored co with the wonderful Malen Villanueva, we think with situated indigenous Kovitakan knowledges that oriented both our anti-colonial research um, and our pedagogical work focused on children's relations to water. And at the same time, we also draw on theories of affect um, that helped us to attend to the complexities of the moments that emerge with the children 
Um, particularly, we draw us on Sarah Ahmed's work on affect to help us pay attention, for instance, um, to our complicated situatedness in those moments as Black and Indigenous researchers working um, with predominantly white settler children. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thanks, we'll be able to dig into more of that later, um, but that was a great way just to kind of give that initial overview of the different philosophical um, traditions and concepts that really have inspired your body of scholarship. Eve, would you like to um, jump in now uh, with that question of what are the philosophical perspectives that really orient how you think about doing inquiry? Yes, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be in conversation today. And thank you, especially to Fakile, who is a, a really beloved colleague and friend and somebody who I learn from and think with. Um, I actually found this to be one of the more challenging questions and I'm always like slow to warm in these kinds of situations and so I feel like I'll say far less than how Fakili has begun um, and far less uh, like prefigured. Um, maybe this is just how today is going to go, uh, but my sense is that it's very hard to separate out uh, who I am as an Unanga person, who I am as a writer and thinker and as a person who um, cares about my relationship, cares about um, my own experiences in the academy and also other people's experiences in the academy at the same time as not really having very much um, faith in the redeemable qualities of many of the disciplines that we are engaging. And so um, I would say that being quite suspicious, being quite um, antagonistic or, or certainly ambivalent has been a through line of, of my approaches to um, both being in the academy and also making work from, from the academy within the academy. Um, as an Unanga person, there are more scholars now who are um, who are also from Unanga communities, um, including Halihana Stepton and Lauren Peters and Liza Mack. But when I was first starting to make work in the academy, there weren't very many other Unanga scholars. And so even though Unangan uh, philosophies and cosmologies are very important to who I am in the world. I have always been very reluctant to um, publish or directly bring stories into academic work because I feel like I've needed more, more guidance, more collaboration in order to think about what stories should be shared and what stories shouldn't be shared. And I would say that like that sensibility about what should be said in public and what shouldn't be, what does the academy deserve and what um, has it not yet proved itself to deserve in terms of asking um, Black communities, asking Indigenous communities to share our stories, um, especially when the academy has not uh, in, worked in good faith in relation to these communities, um, has, has certainly worked in order to um, extend settler colonialism has has worked, you know, in real time and after the fact to justify slavery and transatlantic um, slavery. So uh, I will say that I do think that there are uh, practices of inquiry, practices of writing that we can do in the academy. Um, that we can also practice outside of the academy. I don't think that we, you know, thinking of Orlando Falls Borda and Ansir Rahman's idea of breaking up the monopoly that the academy has on asking questions and being curious and engaging in inquiry practices. I'm especially interested in those practices that are collaborative, that are co-theorizing, that are co-constitutive, um, that uh, work together for as long as they do and then break apart because they're not meant to be uh, um, permanent. And so I think those are some of the sensibilities that I bring to this work that are informed by 
who I am as an Anunga person, who I am as a person who's suspicious of the academy, who I am as a person who still uh, tries to make meaning in any kind of place uh, that I would, any kind of job that I would have under mandatory capitalism as we live in now. Well, I'm going to <clears throat> build on that, Eve, if you don't mind, um, based on the readings that you suggested for today. And I also heard Fakile reference this as she was um, talking a few minutes ago. Um, and so both of the readings that you suggested for today, there's a discussion around the logics of pain and or damage-centered research and this conversation about moving toward desire-based frameworks. Um, and so I guess if you don't mind, maybe spending a little bit of time for those who are with us today, maybe discussing that notion of damage-centered research. And I think the way that Fakile also referred to it was this notion of a theories of change. Um, and then later, I think in the article, the suspending damage um, article, a letter to the communities, you um, provide a cautionary note um, later in the piece. Um, and I, I noticed as I was reading that there was a, a bit of discussions around binaries or opposites and how you see a caution about binaries um, maybe popping up in your other writing as well, and this, this desire for an epistemological shift. Um, so I know that's a lot, but I was just wondering if you might be able to comment or talk a little bit about that for those who maybe read the suggested readings today and how this notion of damage-centered research and theories of change are informed by who you are um, and what you were just sharing with us. Uh, so I, maybe it's clear from my institutional affiliation, but uh, I work at the intersection of education and Indigenous studies, and um, I noticed, uh, so this uh, suspending damage is actually one of the very, my very first publications. I wrote it as I was finishing my PhD and um, actually plotted it out in a car, uh, uh, a ride in a car with Malia Villegas, uh, who was on the editorial board of uh, the Harvard Educational Review when we were on our way to the movies one night um, and just was explaining to her that I was so frustrated and impatient with the only ways, the very overdetermined ways that Indigenous communities in particular are narrated, but also other communities that have, and I would have different language for this now at this point in my career, but um, different language, uh, uh, communities, uh, including Black communities and communities that have really been narrated and defined by um, oppression and, and by uh, relationships that are made for us within white supremacy, within settler colonialism, and the after uh, what Sadia Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery. And so um, I feel like researchers who are often not from those communities go into communities with the very liberal, um, un like idealistic and sort of like unfounded theory of change that if somebody can just shine a spotlight on the harm that has been done to these communities that, you know, really documenting that harm is going to uh, result in um, like a kind of expose that helps people who are innocently causing harm unknowing to them to all of a sudden decide to change their ways. And I hadn't read the work um, that Saidia Hartman was doing in Scenes of Subjection at the time that I wrote that article, but now, you know, I, I would also connect this to her uh, really important um, uh, challenge to the idea of empathy as being like a, a reliable uh, project in terms of uh, in her theorizing of of abolition um, so i saw and i see damage centered narratives as being uh, a very st still uh, um, very prevalent preoccupation of educational research 
um, and much of social science, which is trying to document the pain or document the trauma of, of communities in order to expose it and convince often white and powerful people to give up power and resources. And I don't think we have any evidence that that theory of change works. And so then what happens is um, we just have lots and lots of pain stories about communities. And the only way that they're able to even narrate themselves is through those pain stories. And Others um, have also applied this to the kinds of narratives that are available in even the kind of like um, tell your story types of research that's done with migrants and that's done with um, other other communities um, where they are invited to tell themselves, tell their own stories, but they're scripted in particular ways. And so I've been interested um, in desire-based research and ways that like Audra Simpson has talked about and other scholars um, have talked about in, uh, refusals within uh, communities to engage in these kinds of research practices. Um, I am very curious, like I love the discussions that we might have about theories of change. I wish that we in our societies talked about theories of change like as like a question that we ask on dates and a question that we like, you know, asking people what your astrological sign is. Like, I think we should be talking about our theories of change because I think a lot of so social science operates on that theory of change that if we expose the harm, then people will feel more empathy and they will change their ways. And I feel like that is like not true. Uh, I feel like that is a colonial theory of change, one that is relying on somebody more powerful than us, um, so somebody who has and is going to maintain that power. Uh, and it relies on the innocence of white people, it relies on the innocence of, of settlers uh, who just didn't know that they were like continuing to benefit from settler colonialism. So I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to make work that invests in the empathy of white people towards indigenous communities. I'm not gonna do that. Thanks for sharing. I think I was noticing as I read it, yeah, the, the timing, the year that was on it. And I was curious, and I think we might be able to get into that as we continue today is um, those pieces, like you mentioned, was that one was the first, it sounds like, um, that came to be in the car on the way to a movie. Um, I love hearing the backstories on some, some of the pieces that people have shared on the webinar series, but um, I would love to hear as we continue talking today kind of where you are now, and I um, think that others that are joining us today might also, and how different people, um, different experiences since then um, have influenced how you might talk about that now. So thanks for, for getting us started there, um, started there, Eve. Um, before we go on to the second question, I wanted to come back to you, Fakile, and um, ask you to talk a little bit more about, um, you talked about kind of three um, traditions that have influenced kind of your scholarship as you were sharing a few minutes ago. And I noticed in one of your pieces, as I was reading it today, um, you talked about that third one, posthumanism and the critiques of that and kind of how you sit with that tension or wrestle with that, but then also why um, you find sometimes, like you mentioned earlier, needing affect theory to help you be attuned to certain things. So. I know often that students will ask me, you know, are particular philosophies compatible? Who gets to decide if they are? Can you put them together in conversation with each other? Um, so maybe talk a little bit about how these kind of three traditions that it's, you see overlaps, but you also see that they help you to be attuned or attentive to different things. How do you think about that um, in your work and kind of deciding, you know, when particular threads come into play more? than others? Um, and what do you do when there are those frictions and tensions um, that people might not see as compatible in some way? It's a really good question. I mean, I wouldn't say that I have a, a kind of a uniform approach that I um, engage with the ideas. Um, it's more in terms of what is it that I want to think with and what's helpful to for me to think with something um, in, a, in a deeper way, in a particular in a, with the particular orientation. Um, and I would say that um, 
at times, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to engage with critical post-humanists. And as actually, as I've been reading more Black feminist work, I've been finding um, there are actually some ideas in Black feminist work that actually can do the work that I might have turned to critical post-humanism for, um, actually. So um, it's not always the case that it makes sense for me to bring that into conversation. Um, but the question of incommensibility is one I think that I grapple with um, all the time, um, and I don't think that I have a, a really neat answer to it. I always, if I am in bringing together things that maybe don't make sense, to be really explicit about that and to really underline the tensions. Um, and for instance, um, in in actually in the qualitative inquiry piece that I was just referring to. Um, refer to um, Tiffany Latabo King's work and how she talks about um, how Black feminists actually has, you know, really good reason to be suspicious of post-humanist theories and some of the flattening that occurs um, in relation um, to, um, to Blackness. So yeah, I don't have a really good answer to that. I think that is just something that I'm always kind of grappling with. Um, and at times, um, the tools of critical post-humanism are not necessarily the tools that I turn to, but sometimes, as I just mentioned with the affect piece, they are helpful for me to think about particular moments. So let's jump into our second question, which builds on this one. Um, so the question is about how the philosophical concepts and traditions that you gravitate toward or are inspired by, um, what do they make thinkable or possible for inquiry? Um, and so this question really comes from lots of conversations with students when they are trained in the academy um, to write literature reviews, to have certain methods of data production. Um, and, you know, sometimes as they jump into different theories and philosophies, they find a lot of tension in that. Um, and so talk with us a little bit about kind of how you think about the doing of inquiry. I know, Eve, you talked about the academy, but then also inquiry is not owned by the academy, that inquiry is happening all the time already in the worlds around us, so, and the worlds that we're a part of. So either of you want to start off with that question about what these concepts and philosophies make thinkable or possible or not thinkable or not possible for the work that you do. I feel like, um, <clears throat> Many of my choices are guided by the impulse to try to undermine the legitimacy of the academy, um, to try to diminish the, the influence of the academy and what counts as knowing, what counts as, as being, what counts as making political work. Um, so on one level for me, that means like try to take everything that is kept um, kept elite to like always work in order to undermine what is considered elite um, and so that means taking exactly what i teach at the university of toronto and teaching them to community members to teaching those same practices to young people to teenagers to black and indigenous youth who work with us and so part of it is about um breaking the tendency as much as possible as I like only in my own small way, breaking the tendency of the university to hoard resources, hoard knowledge. Um, and then also pushing back on the academies or like academic discourses desire to know everything, to feel like any question is askable, to feel like, uh, any piece of information that is collectible should be cl collected. And so uh, to also in my uh, social theorizing and in my research practice to kind of move and, and resist those habits of collection and um, yeah, hoarding again. And then in my research practice, my research practice is uh, entirely participatory and collaborative. Um, it's very hard for me to think of work that I would not do or could not do alongside um, community co-researchers or youth who are co-researchers. Sometimes these are community organizations that approach me and ask me to collaborate with them. Other times it's a group that I will uh, will 
create as a, a research collective for some time being. Um, and so I, I think also like to, to think differently about who has expertise, whose expertise matters, whose questions matter, who, um, who makes theory, who's, who's uh, meaning making counts or, or is important to me? How do I spend, how do I spend my time with people? Um, these are all ways that I, I move forward in relation to this second question. Right, and I would love to follow up a little bit um, from the refusing research piece that you shared as a suggested reading. Um, and I'll just read the little part here just in case those who are with us today aren't familiar, but you put forth three axioms that you discuss in the piece with your co-author. Um, the subaltern can speak, but is only invited to speak her or our pain is the first one. The second one, there are some forms of knowledge that the academy doesn't deserve. And I feel like I heard you bring that up a little bit earlier today in some way. And the third is that research may not be the intervention that is needed. Um, and so that piece, the refusing, the R words, refusing research piece, you really dig into those three with the co-author. Um, so do you mind talking a little bit more maybe about those three and how that relates um, to what you were sharing about the ways that you engage or think about um, inquiry in the world? Yeah, I wrote that piece with Kay Wayne Yang. We wrote it a number of years ago. Now we must have written it in 2012 or 2013 because I think it has a publication date of 2014 and that's how things go. Um, we learned and uh, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick was one of my teachers in graduate school. And certainly I learned about the practice of theorizing by making axioms through her, her book, The Epistemological Closet. Um, and so to me, what's, what's compelling about making axioms or writing from a place of having made axioms is that these are things that certainly people would argue against. I mean, like practically everybody in a, in a faculty of education or practically everybody in a, in a, a faculty of arts and science is going to uh, operate in a way that doesn't necessarily agree with those axioms. But what I appreciate about making something axiomatic is that you're taking something that people might argue against and saying, actually, no, this is my baseline. I'm not gonna argue about this anymore. And so I feel like when I think about the, the urgency to set forth those axioms that we must have felt at that point in our careers because we wrote that piece. Now, when I look at what I'm doing with, um, youth co-researchers or what I'm doing in the kinds of uh, theory collaborations or in my own practice as, as a scholar, definitely in my own mentoring is like operating from those axioms. Like I don't even in my daily life feel like I need to argue them very much. Um, I just kind of operate from them. Um, and so certainly that, um, you know, I notice and cannot help but notice that always there is this hunger for pain stories. And so in everything I do, I try to thwart that hunger or, or again, like undermine or, or um, embarrass even that hunger, that desire for pain stories. Uh, I I just lost track of the second one. That the second the second one is there are some forms of knowledge that the academy doesn't deserve. Oh yes, yeah, certainly. So um, actively in the work that I do to mentor graduate students and other early career scholars, certainly like being very explicit about the kinds of things that we publish it about and the kinds of things that we don't because when we're doing research well like we know a lot of stuff about people's lives and what it seems like we're supposed to tell are the stories that also humiliate or the stories that also and so really thinking about well what is it that um, we want to bring into our writing and what we want to bring into circulation um, and being comfortable with the fact that we know stuff that we don't 
tell other people or that there are some collectives where that's where that knowledge is and it's not necessarily meant to be widely distributed um, because people haven't shown themselves to be like responsible with what we know. And then, um, and, and so that is definitely informed by my theory of change of like, who has power? Who needs to know this? Who already has known this? And like, why are we doing this if everybody always knew it? And so that has to do with the third one, which is like research is not always the intervention that is needed that like, sometimes we need a billboard or sometimes we, we like, especially when um, like, I feel, I feel like it's quite cynical to engage in a whole study and invite people to respond to questions that the answers to those questions are already widely known. It's just that it's like certain, again, often white people um, who like refuse to know it. And so then that's something else that's not research that's going to convince a person to stop being so awful. Um, that's not my theory of change. So I'm interested in like research as a craft, inquiry as a craft. Um, I, in the same ways that I'm interested in dancing and running and karate and pottery as a craft. And so it's a thing that humans do. We invented this, we make this work, we do it in a deliberate way. We do it for a certain amount of time um, because we, because it's like interesting and beautiful and connective for us to do. Um, it allows me to see other possibilities for research rather than believing that it can do something that um, people don't it, like, I'm not going to spend my time trying to change people who will never take me seriously. If Akile, would you like to jump in on this question about what philosophies that you engage with make thinkable or not thinkable or possible or not possible um, in the doing of inquiry. And as I was reading, and you might already be thinking about speaking about this, um, you know, and you mentioned this at the beginning is that your work is so interconnected um, um, inquiry and your pedagogical work with young children in the world. And so I um, wonder too, if you might speak a little bit about, because um, many of the communities you engage with are in spaces with young children and so how that shapes the way you think about what's thinkable or possible with inquiry. Sure, um, I would say, you know, the philosophical approach has helped to shape the stories that I tell in my research and I would echo um, what Eve has said in terms of wanting to trouble um, what counts as theory and also what counts as data. Um, so for me, this often means that I'm working um, simultaneously with concepts, with images, with songs, with land, waters, with histories um, that are together a part of the stories that I want to tell about my research and are not necessarily separate. Um, so for instance, um, in that piece that I referred to earlier, where I wanted to engage with what it might look like to put refiguring presences to work in dialogue with my work with young children um, in this forest, um, it was important for me to think about data as not only what happened with children and educators, though that was really important, but then to alongside bring some interruptive elements to juxtapose with these encounters um, and actually do the work of refiguring presences that wasn't actually present in our encounters. So for instance, as I mentioned, um, bringing in um, images of logged trees, thinking about colonial histories in that particular forest, um, writing a speculative story about what we might learn from the rotting hollows in that forest and so on. Um, and so I think I would just say that I found most generative to think about writing in ways that don't make strict boundaries around what's data and what's theory, um, what's speculative storytelling. Um, but I think I also want to emphasize that it doesn't mean that, you know, anything goes in terms of the research, that it's always grounded in the ethos that I mentioned earlier in relation to wanting to disrupt anti-Blackness, settler colonialism, and anthropocentrism. I think what I noticed across um, what both of you are saying in some ways um, is this idea of, you know, for you, Fikile, pedagogies and working with young children and inquiry and doing research practices. As I read your suggested readings for today, it's hard to define those as separate, it seems like, in many ways. And 
Um, I think even the way that you talk about working with communities and youth, I mean, it's not that there's this inquiry or research thing that's happening in the academy, and then there's what's happening, whether it's with, you know, the children that you work with, Fakile or youth, it's very much intertwined, it seems, in some way that these aren't these separate things. Um, so that really does, I think, take us to our third question around methodologies and methods. Um, and I think I was struck in your writing, Fakile, talking about pedagogical documentation, which for those in the early years or childhood studies communities um, draw upon that from the Reggio Emilia schools in Italy. And so as I was, as I was thinking about this notion of methods and methodologies and that you do, um, I think what I really was drawn to in your writing, Fakile, was um, this focus on minor events or what might be called kind of everyday mundane interactions. And so maybe talk with us a little bit about how you think about methodologies and methods and the, the work that you're doing and perhaps to elaborate or illuminate a little bit more about these everyday mundane interactions that you really find it seems generative um, and the thinking that you're doing. Yes, um, and maybe um, to answer that, it would be helpful to talk about pedagogical documentation, because I would say for me, that's really been essential, both as a methodological tool, as data, as data collection method, and as a way to really facilitate the inquiry based work that I do with children and educators. Um, and so pedagogical documentation for those that don't know is kind of the visual, textual, and, um, and sonic traces of curriculum making, including artifacts that are made by the children. Um, and it can also include educators and families' perspectives on the encounters. Um, and so in working you know, in these everyday encounters that you mentioned, um, pedagogical documentation really becomes a way to collectively make meaning of these encounters. Um, to share them with families for their perspectives and together to think about, you know, what we might want to do next with the children to build on the inquiry um, and even to create movement in a different direction. Um, and one of the things about um, documentation that I have found really enriching in my research and pedagogical work is that it, um, and this relates to what our earlier discussions around theory is that I think it creates openings um, for theory to not just be something that me as the researcher does and brings to educators, for instance, but also to think about how children and educators as well um, are theorizers in the work. Um, and um, also to really interrupt, um, I think, early childhood education as usual. Um, because as we come together around a piece of documentation, we can collectively kind of really um, kind of question the taken for granted ways that we think about children and their relations, um, and then to think about what other perspectives can help us to think differently. Um, so I don't know if that kind of speaks to your question. Sure, and was there anything else for that question that you wanted to share that you didn't get the chance to from the way I framed it? No, I think that's good. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So for, for, um, for you, Eve, and I was reading your pieces, um, I was also struck, and maybe some of the people joining us today or in the future, um, about your discussions and the way that you would weave in conversations around autoethnography or participatory action research or other approaches that might be seen as like non-dominant or um, maybe seen somewhat as radical in the academy, but you're still talking about them in a way that, um, helps us to pause and to question what they're producing and what they're doing in the world and who they're serving. Um, and I noticed in your pieces too, that you thread, uh, some of the big questions that you thread throughout is not only about methodological choice, but really about axiological questions and the doing of research to what end and for who. Um, so for example, in the, in the piece, the R words refusing research, you write about theorizing with rather than about, but also theorizing as. So I wondered if any of that might be something you can talk a little bit about um, in relation to this third question on methodolog methodologies and methods. Huh. Um, well, one thing that uh, maybe it's helpful for me to make it explicit is that I think that 
I mean, I, sh I didn't say this earlier, but I also am, and perhaps it's very important in these times for people who are watching from the United States to like also name explicitly how critical race theory um, has informed my work. And so to me, um, race and racialization and racism are very important uh, um, dynamics for me to pay attention to. And so um, that is why I call out whiteness as being like many of these things that I'm trying to um, trying to undermine or thwart is also like the, the, the whiteness of inquiry practice and and the, you know, so I definitely associate the desire to know everything and the belief that everything should be known and there should be li no limits to knowledge and like it's undemocratic and like wrong for everything to not be just easily accessible to everybody, which like really runs counter to indigenous uh, knowledge systems, if we want to call it that, or, or axiologies and relationships to knowledge in which people learn um, from people who love them. Uh, um, people uh, learn uh, at the right time in their lives. People learn what is important for them to know and that uh, there's more of a kind of peaceable comfort with the idea that not everything is to know to be known right now. And so I, I definitely locate that kind of um, that kind of uh, insatiable and and arrogant desire to know everything in my understanding of how whiteness operates. Um, how capitalism operates. So then when I'm pointing to how research has been used to forward settler colonialism or justify after the fact uh, theft of land or genocide, I feel like people who are not wet, ready to grapple with whiteness um, or, or white supremacy, then their response is to try to like just diminish research like oh we're just hanging out or like i'm not really a researcher i'm just like a friend who has a university job um and i feel like the the impulse is to just like not stop doing inquiry but to try to dissolve the boundary between everyday living and research as though like there's not really inquiry happening here or like there's no start to or finish just like we're just keeping it cash <laughs> and so um i actually like move in the other direction in which i get super formal about the start of research i'm very formal and awkward and bring so much attention to asking for consent um there is no like there is no mistake that when the research part of my collaboration with people who I care about so much and they care about me, there's these are very mutual relationships, but there is no mistake that when we are in the moment in which we are asking research questions or we're writing, um, we're, we're engaging in an inquiry process, there's no mistaking that that is research. Um, I like bring more attention to the boundary between living and research practice because it's a practice we're doing this on purpose we're doing this with each other on purpose and so what that looks like in my in work with young people is that whether it's me facilitating or or graduate students who are facilitating um a work session with uh young people with with uh high school aged young people uh, there will be a moment where the young people are like, hey, like this actually is like a really good conversation. Uh, do we all agree that we should turn on the recorder for now? And so there's um, moments where even though it feels awkward, even though it feels like you're breaking the fourth wall or something and you're breaking relationship. No, it's like taking care of relationships to really emphasize consent. Um, the the work that I have been doing in recent years has been um, to engage more and more in participatory photography and other visual methods like so visual methods like concept mapping has always been part of my practice, but 
in more recent years, I would say since since I first got tenure at my first workplace um, in 2014, I have made a very deliberate turn towards visual methods and recording based methods in order to think and teach myself and 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 really uh, expand my practice beyond text. Um, I didn't realize that like lots of times still that ends up even visual methods end up being very text based, at least in my own practice. Um, but even to engage with young people in um, participatory photography projects in which they are often having to awkwardly like in a way that feels very embarrassing because we live in a, in a society that actually tries to uh, avoid asking for consent. Um, they have to ask for consent, like, hey, can I take your photo? And like, explain why, like, what about you was so photographic in this moment? Um, what about you is like, is making me feel like this should be uh, made into a photograph. And so I feel like asking for consent, heightening the moments in which we, in our relationships that are mutual, relationships that are caring, relationships that have a life outside of the research activities, um, uh, heightening that boundary between when I'm engaging with you as myself, as a person who is in your life, and when I'm doing that as a researcher, um, when we are being researchers together, I think that those are part of how how I think through this. Thanks for sharing. I was just jotting down notes. So this notion of being super formal about consent and in a sense, it sounds maybe um, contradictory, but it's really, um, as you said, about taking care of relationships and, and talking about um, more attention to boundaries. And so um, I assume we might have some questions around that too as we get into the Q and A in a few minutes. But there's a lot to think about there in that response, Eve. Um, before we, our final question is really just about students and how we mentor and work with um, our students in the academy and in the and then the communities that we're a part of. Um, so I wanted to just give a couple minutes because I know it's already come up through some of the other conversations we've had today. But just to give a moment to see if there's anything else either of you might want to share. Um, oftentimes our students are asking us just about how we navigate within the academy, um, navigate the institution, things related to dissertations, um, um, you know, exams, comprehensive exams, et cetera, as well as the publishing world, you know, the pressure for grants, et cetera, the list could go on and on. Um, so if there's anything that two of you might want to share about that question, but then I'd also like to turn a little bit of time for a conversation across um, the two of you before we move into our questions and answers from those in attendance today. So Fakile or Eve, anything else that you might um, share about mentorship and working with students in the academy who might be engaging um, in different philosophical perspectives and or um, identify in ways that the academy is not um, as welcoming to or open to or able to hear or listen, um, what, what words might you share? Um, I can try to get started. I work with amazing students. I learn from amazing students at the University of Toronto and elsewhere too, there's some mentoring that I do to uh, students at other universities. I, um, I definitely think it's so important to, I mean, research takes a long time and it is hard. It's I have to remind people often like this is one of the hardest things that you've ever done so it's okay that it feels challenging it that's real um but i think for that reason it's really important to ask questions that matter to you um not questions that are answerable uh within the certain amount of time which is sometimes how people are taught to ask a dissertation dissertation question but um questions that matter. I do encourage people to think about what will be next projects and think of our pro our research as um, there's a lot of people in my life who are beading, who, who, who make beadwork as, as an art practice. And so to think of our work each 
um, project that we engage in, um, whether that's a collaborative project or one that we are leading, each piece of writing that we do, like this is all something that we're stringing together. And at first it can just look, look like a string of beads, but then when you start to sew it to the hide, that over time is how the image or that how is how the design um, starts to emerge. And so sometimes it's thinking about like, well, what is the first bead that needs to be um, strung and sewn. Um, what do I need? What can I ask now while I'm having all of the support of my committee and all of this other kind of mentorship in my career in a way that I might not have a couple projects from now? And so it's not like, what is the first study that needs to be done um, in order to have these other studies made more possible in the future? Um, but again, like it, to me, it's not just doing it for doing its sake. Uh, there does need to be something that is aligned about what what is important, what is um, what is the question for this person to work on. I mean, I think people can be really good, and I learned about this from Lee Patel. Um, yeah, like yeah, you have a great question. It's not your question to ask. Like you don't actually have enough relationship with the people who this has major consequences for for you to be asking this question what's your work what's your what what is it that you should be working on and i feel like i've seen her mentor and seen her ask questions that really help people sort through that her book educational research is oh no decolonizing educational research is like a great place to turn to for a discussion about that um but yeah like i think uh I think our work that we, sometimes people are doing work in very lonely places. They're the only person at their institution or the only, like they are working with mentors who don't really understand what they're doing or they're working in university settings where everybody seems to be like really invested in other, uh, other uh, epistemological, uh, stakes and so i know that that can be very lonely and so another way to think about the work that we do is like it is kind of like a lighthouse like it is shining something out sometimes and it is how other people find us um uh, there have been so many beautiful people in my life who have who have just come into my life because they read this little thing that I wrote or they came to this little thing that happened. And I also like am a little bit of a private person, a shy person. So just because you read my writing and you like that thing, like that's why I wrote it so that I can put it out there and not have to know everybody who <laughs> wants to interact. But sometimes it's a really like important way that people um, come into our lives. And so that's another reason that that should be like really what you want to work on, because it's going to bring people into your life. It's going to bring energy into your life. And so um, don't do something that is fake or just for the purposes, just for the the exercise of getting a dissertation or the exercise of getting tenure, like lots of people who talk about, oh, my real work will start after tenure. And it's like, oh my gosh, that's such a long time to be putting out false bat signals about who you want to come into your life. Um, and so have that be, uh, um, have that bead work or have that, that bat signal that you're putting out there be something that will bring even if you're feeling lonely now, will it will invite the kind of company that you're hoping hoping to have in the future? It's so beautiful, Eve. I love that imagery of the lighthouse, or you know, putting out the signals and thinking about who you're inviting to come in your life in that way. That's a beautiful way to think about that. Tequila, anything that you want to um, add about mentoring and and working with students that you work with um, before we open a space up for the two of you to talk a little bit across your work. Yeah, I would just echo everything that Eve has said. Um, I don't have specific advice, but I would just say that, you know, mentoring is one of my favorite things that I get to do as part of my job. I, you know, present with students at conferences and work closely with them as co-researchers. 
Um, and one of my favorite things that I was able to do at UT Austin was to teach a qualitative inquiry course um, and to help students to think about, you know, what are the concepts that make sense for what they're most interested in in their research. Um, and so doing that work is really important to me. That's all I would add. Right. I love hearing that mentoring is your favorite part. I think for many people that is the case. Um, um, so before, before we do our Q&A time, I just wanted to let people know if you have a question to go ahead and start writing it and putting it in the Q&A box. And that way Viv and Erin in a few minutes can begin to ask those. But before we shift to that, um, I know that the two of you had mentioned wanting a little space to think across your work. Um, you, are, you happen to be at the same institution right now. And, and um, as I read both of your, your suggested readings, I could see a lot of intersections. So I'll just open it up for either one of you, both of you to share a little bit about what you're thinking about related to that. I can just start by saying that um, Fikile, for lots of for lots of reasons, I have been following and learning your, from your work for a long time. Um, one of the things that I have learned so much from you is about, um, I think like it, I might draw a parallel to this and what Lisa Lowe calls like past conditional temporality, which is some a concept that she learns about by reading from Edward Said, but it is about like reading something or reading a moment or reading um a pedagogical encounter in a way that um, reads it now with meaning that wasn't necessarily imbued in the moment um, i feel like there's something in the theorizing that you do where people are like well that's just not the level of the conversation that happened and i think that that's kind of a, a one way in educational research that like opportunities for theorizing deeper meaning or for moving from practice to theory and back again is kind of explained away. Well, like I, I didn't know how to ask that question to parents. Or I didn't know how to ask that question to young people. And so that's just not the level that we were ever able to get to. And they kind of underestimate spaces, underestimate um, classrooms or underestimate early learning um, settings or college or university settings for like what wasn't possible in real time. And so I love that your work um, kind of uh, moves back and forth with time. You're so playful with time and then um, has, has found ways to very ethically revisit and uh, both in real time, like I think that this is part of your pedagogical practice too, like you return to conversations and say, like add layers, add remixes, add um, other kinds of reverberations that I, th I have learned so much from in terms of like, just because it feels like that moment is over, doesn't mean that that moment is over, that we can continue to learn, continue both in, in our writing and in our practice to return to something. And then the other thing that I learn from your work every time I read it is about writing with texture. And I like do think about those logs and the moss and the, like, I, the, the, places where you are describing children in particular places like your writing is so textured like it's so bumpy and so smelly and so sensory um so squishy like feeling i like can imagine the squish of the moss and so there's something really um i mean effective but also like uh trans transportive about how you were writing about place that I learned from every time I ever engage your work. Thank you. Um, first, I want to share um, with, you know, with the audience that Eve, you've inspired my work for a long time. Um, so when my doctoral supervisor asked me who would be my dream external examiner, you were, of course, at the top of my list. And I was so nervous and ecstatic when you said yes. Um, and so while I want to speak about some of the ways in which, you know, your work has inspired me, I also want to just begin by saying that you've been a really great mentor in helping me navigate the academy. So I'm really thankful to have you as a colleague and friend. Um, and I mentioned earlier your paper on system, suspending damage in communities. Um, and I've really, I've returned to that paper many times um, from when I first encountered it in my doctoral studies. 
Um, and as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, my most recent revisiting of that was to place it into conversation with Black feminist theories of refusal, um, which um, brings me to something that I really um, appreciate about your work in that it's really um, been generative in relation to being in conversation with Black studies and its ability to be placed in conversation with work in Black studies. Um, which is something I'm always working with as well. Um, and I think it's so important both within and beyond the academy in relation to Black Indigenous um, and Black Indigenous relationality co-theorizing work. Um, so I really um, appreciate that aspect of your work. Um, I would say also your work on critical place inquiry and land education has been really important to my own thinking um, in doing around unsettling place-based education. Um, and in particular, your book with um, Marsha McKenzie on place and research was so helpful I was, as I was completing my dissertation um, and really trying to find language for um, non-anthropocentric and anti-colonial ways of thinking about place and land. Um, and so I've really found critical place inquiry, to, again, to be something that I, that I return to um, again and again. And then I also wanted to mention um, your paper um, before dispossession or surviving it, which is another paper that I return to often um, written with Andrew Morrill um, and the Super Futures Horn, Horn Collective. Um, and I've assigned this paper many times in qualitative research methods uh, courses um, and just really appreciate the beautiful, effective storying um, and theorizing work that that paper does. Um, and it's been really inspirational for students to see possibilities for, um, for really generatively bringing theories into conversation with narratives, with artwork, with poetics. Um, and I highly recommend it to anyone in the audience that has not read that work. Um, I feel like there's so much more I could say, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, would you like to start yeah. us off with the questions that are coming in? Yeah, we've got, um, I think everyone is really enjoying the discussion. I've had a number of mess, um, personal messages and I see also in the chat that people are very much benefiting from this conversation. Um, we have two, two questions for Figila and two for Eve. So um, what I propose is that um, maybe, Erin, uh, you should start with Figile's questions, and then I will um, follow up with two questions for Eve. Sure. The first question is, uh, the, the person who asked the question said they are inspired by your artful and radical relational pedagogical work with young children, and they identified your strategies as largely place-based but wondered how you may have thought about or practiced similar decolonial strategies for engaging the human and more than human entanglements virtually, while also honoring that, those situated physical places. Specifically during the pandemic. Oh, that's a really good <laughs> question. Actually, my research was pretty much halted during the pandemic because of that. So. Um, I have uh, recently funded work to do, um, to do work in my home community in Eswatini on climate justice pedagogies, and I haven't been able to think of a way that I can do that work without sitting, you know, down with elders and children and being on the land um, and, you know, thinking about how drought has affected the community. So, Unfortunately, my answer to that is that um, I haven't been able, not to say that it's not possible, but in my own work, I have not been able to think of a way that I can do the kind of work that I'd like to do within a virtual context. That is unfortunate. Uh, there was another question uh, specifically pertaining to your water song drawing. Um, and this person saw it as one of the best examples of how embodied learning occurs and how embodied learning can uh, fit well with arts-based methods. Uh, they also noted that your studies and practices can be applied to not only children, but also adult learners. And so there was the question, if educators want to apply this practice to higher education settings, is there anything in particular that should be considered in that revision or application across settings? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm always wary of the word application because I think of, you know, what I do is quite situated and specific to the where of, you know, and I learned that from Eve, the where of inquiry. Um, but um, I think, you know, there is, of course, ways in which um, that work can be done in different settings. So in, you know, in the graduate courses that I teach, um, we do um, go and spend time outside and think with some of the concepts and the questions that I think with with educators and young children. Um, so I think there is a way to do that work, but to think about how um, it's very situated work and it's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a transporting of something that was very specific to Coatacan lands and in Texas to then think about applying that somewhere else. Do you have general suggestions for doing embodied learning uh, or arts utilizing arts-based methods in the higher education setting? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I have, um, like I said, um, do that in my classes in terms of, uh, you know, just spending time outside and thinking with the particular, um, you know, what are the anti-colonial, anti-racist questions that emerge from being in a particular place um, and students can respond in arts-based ways to, to being in a particular place and noticing the particular colonial erasures in a place, for instance. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to two questions. We do have more now, but these are both for Eve. And I'm going to read both of them, Eve, and you can respond to them. So the one is about the consent that you spoke about, particularly about the photograph and clarifying what, the sub what about the subject is worthy of photography. And um, this person said, I want to think more about the tools of social science research. What does it mean for this kind of research that we do in the social sciences, that our tools are often products of colonial science? The camera, for instance, with its sordid history of anti-Blackness, what does it mean to resist settler colonial agendas of the academy in terms of rethinking the tools of research and reforming them? So I'm going to read the second question as well. Um, I really appreciate the resistance of living and engaging in the academy under whiteness and colonialism. My struggle is that I'm aware of the different knowledges and ways of researching in the world, but I don't have the choices to send out my global South bat signal when the signal is still very much only dissertation. How would you advise PhD students to live in the ruins of having to conform and respond to our own stories and inheritances when the ruins are still very much active in favor of colonialism? So I'll just leave you to respond to those two. Um, I'm trying to think if I can respond to them both at the same time. I don't know that I can do that, but um, one thing, and I, I feel like this is um, Lisa Matze and Alicia Youngblood Jackson who have talked about the idea that when we're referring to method, we're always like referring using words that seem like we're they are agreed upon, um, but like in in practice they're so different and they're different because of who we are. And maybe this is like now like Eve Tuck building onto this idea, but like those words are always a proxy, and so um, it is a little bit like especially when we're writing grants or we're describing to the university or you know kind of in these accountability cultures where we're like well you know participatory research is kind of like a bunch of focus Thank group you. like there's always a kind of approximation or a um a likening it to something else so that somebody can maybe get enough of a of a grasp on what we're doing in order to then start a conversation. And so I think that that's true with uh, phot photography, participatory photography. Um, and so I don't, 
I mean, in the work that we do with young people, certainly part of how we are thinking about what images do in the world and what a camera does in the world is informed by, um, you know, theorizations of, of cameras and their incomplete and always um, um, insufficient uh, recording of like the, the beauty of black skin and um, the uh, use of the camera as again, like justification for uh, colonial violence and um, that those are definitely parts of how we trouble using photography and engaging in photography and then young people, uh, you know, definitely have other uses of photography all the time um, and are are participating in in making phot photographs all the time. And so this is why I think it's important to think with our collaborators when there are think with our co researchers. Um, um, and so yeah, I do think that that means that when a young person is asking consent from a stranger, somebody you don't know, or from their their mother to take to sit for a portrait, um, I think that this work in order to interrogate what cameras do, what photography does, what it, um, how it has been used to speak against us, um, I do think that they're requests for consent are imbued with those understandings. I think we can, I mean, I, I haven't written about this, it's part of the, our practice, but like our practice is so massive, we can't write about everything in it. Um, I have written with Deanna Del Vecchio about like, well, what is it that we think images are doing for a reader, like when we like drop an image into an essay. Um, are we then using text to explain what that image does, or are we just saying that this image is self explanatory? Like, what are we doing when we're engaging with images as data? Um, and what does it do to start thinking of uh, photographic practice as in relation to inquiry practice? Um, I think I am shifting from initial questions in which I was saying, well, how are photographs data? And like, what are we doing when they are data? And what are we doing when they're not? Into instead asking something else, I don't know. Um, then I've lost track of the second question, but we're so close to time, time to time, goals. Yeah. Um, perhaps, I don't know if you'd be prepared to follow up on the questions that have been asked in emails or something like that. Um, because we are at almost at time and they're, they're, they're about um, five or so more questions. So I'm not sure if we, um, if you would be prepared to do that, both of you. No, I'm not willing to answer questions over email. Okay. Um, not because, I, well, no, I'm not. Um, but I think that I can, I can see a lot of the questions yeah. here. I see that these are questions that aren't only answerable by me and Fikile. Um, I think that these are questions that could drive future conversation among the collective that is gathered here, questions that you might ask to your mentors, questions that you might ask on TikTok. Um, I think all of these are questions are not uniquely answerable by us, and that's why I'm comfortable with not committing to having email exchanges around them. Right, okay. Well, it is um, time to close. So thanks to everyone for attending today. We've had a good um, turnout. And um, thank you both for your time and for engaging with us. Um, people have re really, really appreciated it, I think.
Um, and I'm going to hand over to Candice then for some closing comments. Sure. <clears throat> yes, I'll just echo um, Viv. Thank you both so much for your time and expertise and generosity and candidness and sharing backstories and and the ways that you engage in the world um, within the institution of the academy, as well as the communities that you're in relationship with. Um, I think I would agree that um, many of our students and others that are here today um, found it quite generative, even if just the number of questions that were populated that people are really provoked and thinking about the concepts and things that you're sharing. Um, so I just wanna remind those that are here today or watching us in the future um, that our next webinar is on July 15th with Sarah Truman, a postdoctoral research fellow and lecturer at Melbourne Graduate School of Education in Australia. So as Viv noted before, the time is changing for this that we can accommodate um, Sarah's time, um, time zone in Australia. And so it's about two and a half hours earlier than our normal start time. So it'll be 10 p.m. for Sarah um, seven for central um, time zone and 2 p.m. for Cape Town. And so just be sure to check out our webpage for that. We'll also be posting some suggested readings by Sarah in the next few weeks. So you can check that out on our webpage. Um, so Fikile or Eve, any, any closing words or thoughts you'd like to share before we um, say goodbye for the day? Just thank you for hosting us. Yes, thank you so much. It was great to spend some time together today. Well, thanks to you both. And thanks to all who are in attendance today and those that will continue to engage with this webinar in the future. I hope you have a great rest of your day.